Hello fellow creators, I am Pruitt and this is Jim Davis and on today's web DM we're going to teach you how to dress your world with deities because over here we put our pantheon one god at a time. Let's get to it. Okay Jim Davis, uh, in our fantasy it's our escape. Yeah. Do we really need to bring in creating gods there too? I'm well, sorry, I didn't mean to. No, I'm sorry. <laughs> I, the existence of a pantheon of gods in uh -huh. fantasy uh, role playing uh -huh. is one of those things that I find very bizarre personally because right. the pantheons that are created for these fantasy role playing games very rarely resemble the pantheon like pantheons of deities that we can point to in in like Earth's own mm -hmm. uh, religious history where the gods are are intimately tied to some sort of mythology or something and, and very closely connected with each other and there's all these stories about them that that tie them together. Well, yeah, right. I mean, you know, Athena busting out of Zeus's head and sure, all sure. blind, but, and it's all very interconnected, like almost like familial. There's that, there's the whole like, the world is a rotting carcass and the mm -hmm. animals and monsters and gods come out of it that's sort of like Norse uh, mythology as I, as I understand it at least. But then you get to like Dungeons and Dragons and Dungeons and Dragons derived fantasy, which Dungeons and Dragons has been around long enough now that it has both influenced other genres like iterations of fantasy role playing, whether it's tabletop or video games or whatever, and then has in turn been influenced by those that it influenced first off. So it's sort of like having a conversation with itself. And, and snake I, is eating its own tail. Right, yeah. and I think when some things are introduced into that and they're not examined and they're not reimagined, then they just get regurgitated ad nauseum to the point where it's like, here's another bog standard bullshit fantasy pantheon, which is just a collection of micro monotheisms that have no weight to them. There's not a faith that's necessary for your character to belong to and to practice and to engage with. It's just like, this is the god of fire and the goddess of the earth and the mm -hmm. god of whatever and commerce and whatever. And it's just mm -hmm. like, it's bloodless, toothless, bullshit gods. And I frankly am tired of them. Uh, yeah. And so I, I, it's one of those things when I, when I see a fantasy setting and it's got yet another fantasy pantheon, that's like, why did you even fucking go to the trouble of making this up yourself? Like, it's nothing original about it. There's nothing different about it. It's just the same thing. I'm talking strictly in like a published adventure type, you know, I'm yeah. buying a campaign setting. If it's, if it's got another fantasy pantheon in it, it's a mark against it for me. Because it's like, right. I don't, you don't even need to think to create up one of these. You just do it. Well, yeah, I mean, okay, oh, what's the, what's the, the god of the sun and mornings and new beginnings? Yeah. What's the god of love? Death and ending. What's the god of death? What's yeah, the yeah. god of, in you know, you're just slapping a different face and a different name right. on, on an already known concept. And that, while that is easy to do, what are some different kind of schemes that you could at least draw from? Right. So, so if you're looking to freshen things up, you want something different, my suggestion would be to first Look outside of the pantheon model of divinities. Of, of polytheism? Or right. And it's a polytheism that I find very bizarre and very little connection to the historical modes that I'm familiar with. And maybe for some people who are not steeped in like ancient religion and whatever else, you know, that they've spent way too much time reading about, they don't care, you know, and, and a bog standard by the book kind of uh, pantheon. I do this when I'm like, I don't want to think about it. Like, it, uh, I'm not, this, my, the point of this world is not to go in depth about the gods or I'm going to let them come from the bottom up in which case I will let the players take the lead on what kind of gods there are. Yeah. This show is a top-down approach type of show. We're talking world building, we're talking crafting the deep backstory of your world that will inform your campaign. Mm -hmm. And so in that sense, it's worth taking a look at the divinities and, and, and uh, gods and the like uh, that you have in your setting and asking some real questions about them. Why am I making the choices that I'm making? Is there something about the choices that I'm making that I'm just like going off of what was there before? And if I'm doing that, than doing it because you're conscious of it, not because you're just like replicating the same mode mm -hmm. of, of the pantheon of monotheisms, <laughs> the, the collection of monotheistic religions that uh -huh. most fantasy is. You could go like full on straight monotheism. And this is one of those that I have personally found and at, both in my experience as a dungeon master and in reading about online, that it makes a lot of people uncomfortable. That yeah. when you say there is one God in my setting, this is it. These are the powers associated with it. These are the social structures that are associated with it. This is the religion that's attached to it. That when you do that, you, number one, you're 
if you're not creating an expansive enough monotheism, then you might be limiting character concepts for your players. They might be resentful of that. There's a whole real world angle going on over here, right? Where people are just, you know, maybe they're uncomfortable with real world religions, they're not familiar with it, they don't like it, they're irreligious or a-religious or atheist mm -hmm. or whatever uh, stripe of non-religious participating they are, and they just don't want to have to deal with it. Right. A monotheism is one, that's something to bring up in a session zero, or, or even before then, and just like, hey, my, my setting has a, a you know a monotheistic uh, flavor, there's one god. Uh, you could go the other route, like dual gods, a sort of Manichaean dualism, where there's one god and then an opposing god, whether that's light and dark, creation and destruction, good, evil, law, chaos, whatever dichotomy you're going for, that can be one. That ties nicely in with a cosmic conflict of some kind, you know. Uh, I'm thinking of something like uh, Middle Earth, the main deity that's in Middle, e Middle Earth, Iluvatar, and then Melkor and, mm -hmm. and Morgoth, and all the other sort of like dark angelic beings, and and the that's kind of a, a setting that has a monotheism, right? There's like this one god, and then it created all these other celestial beings to help it create the world and Earth and all that other business. So there's celestial beings that you can appeal to, that you can interact with and whatever, but they're not gods. They're more powerful than mortals, might as well be gods, but there's still a, a ranking there. So that's sort of a way of, of blending the two. If you're doing like a dualism, maybe one of the deities is a proper deity and the other is more of like a demonic figure of some kind, lesser in power, but because they're lesser in power, they're, it's easier for them to interact with the mortal world or something. Or you can go to the opposite end of the spectrum and be like full on animist, where like everything has a spirit oh, yeah. and a, a godling an elemental spirit a, a something or other and and the role of divine classes in the game is placating all of these spirits so if you have say a cleric of war for instance then there's no god of war that they appeal to but there are spirits and gods of war maybe a god of fear or a god of discipline or something like like that where they're not like all powerful all encompassing deities they're more like forces that move in the world mm -hmm. that the cleric's are part of. So those are some options that are available. And the reason why I kind of bring it up, and, and I don't mean to like misdirect our viewers here where it's like, we're gonna talk about building a pantheon. Fuck a pantheon, you shouldn't do this at all. <laughs> we will get to building a pantheon here in a minute. Yeah, yeah. But before you get to that step of laying out which gods are in your setting, it is worthwhile to ask yourself, why am I doing this? What is the point of the divine beings in my setting? Why am I choosing a pantheon over some of these other schemes, or get other arrangements of, of divinities in your game? Like, why is that? And if the answer is just kind of like, uh -huh. Because there should be gods, because there's spells. <clears throat> right. That's an opportunity for a dungeon master to sit with that concept a little longer mm -hmm. and think it through and fully develop it. Yeah. Thinking of some questions that we can ask ourselves for for those things. I really think that a founding myth well, yeah, is I mean, important, right? Yeah, I was going to say, Jim, where do you begin? I begin at the begin. At the begin. <laughs> <laughs> in the first chapter. The founding myth yeah. is important because it sets the tone for everything in your campaign. You're starting at a cosmic level, a large scale, right? I'm a big advocate of the bottom-up approach to campaign design, where it's like, you really just need a starting adventure location and stuff that's going on there, mm -hmm. and is we'll there build a temple out there? from there. No, well then who cares? Like, then who cares? But world building is a fun exercise. It, it, yeah. it helps us, and as you build a campaign from the bottom up, you can take the time in between sessions to start top-down building as well. And see where they meet. And see where they meet. And, and you know, you take the elements that are mentioned in the bottom-up play and then create a top-down elements for them in between sessions, for instance. And so thinking about a founding myth is important. Where do the planes come from? Mm -hmm. Who lives there and how did they get there? That's kind of where I would start. This is the entire cosmos. Is it the Great Wheel cosmology of outer plane, transit, uh, you know, astral, prime, ethereal, inner? Is it something completely different? Are you going with like the fourth edition model of the elemental chaos and then the sort of the astral sea method there or, or something completely different? Thinking about that is going to be important. Considering the place of the multiverse and the planes and everything is important. Those chapters in the DMG that talk about the different planes and what happens there are jumping off points for this. Maybe you start combining different ones or coming up with your own altogether. Mm -hmm. um, moving on from that, if there are planes and if there are inhabitants to those planes, then what about the gods? Where do the gods come from? Were they eternal? Yeah. Are they always present? One day decided to start creating things. Mm -hmm. Or do the mortal races and, and, and creation precede the gods? And later on the gods come about because of belief and faith and, and the well, power yeah. of that. Yeah. Right? Even the gods there could be from a 
a bottom-up approach where right. the, the people actually create the gods. That's kind of a, a strong theme that runs through Dungeons and Dragons, where like the active faith of a bunch of people brings mm -hmm. power to the gods. That's kind of the default mode for it. Yeah, kind of bring up a point you you you, you touched on earlier when it comes to faith and, and the creation of if it's gods versus men, like who created who. But uh -huh. In in D and D, such a thing in our own world with religion is the fact of faith, and mm -hmm. it's, it's it's the fact of you know well it's that in the absence of evidence like but in D and D like evidence is everywhere. You if you do your prayers and you cast a spell mm -hmm. and you are a, a priest or a cleric, you get spells. How does that affect faith, and how does faith change because there is direct evidence? I mean, if, if you're going by that baseline where existence of the deities in Dungeons and Dragons worlds and other sort of typical traditional fantasy worlds is real, and there's evidence for it because of spells, you can talk to them, you can summon their servants, you can do all these things, then faith is less a matter of like the kind of faith that we understand it of like a devotion to a principle or an ideal or a something that we have no tangible proof of and it is instead adherence to a stricture of rules and and, mm -hmm. and a code of conduct that is handed down from a, a higher order being and then faith there is less about like trust and hope and it's more about obedience and and conformity. Yeah, or, right. or the faith that, that what you adhere to is the right path. I like, personally like adding in that element of are there gods, are there not? That's why I really liked Eberron, right? Like there is no evidence uh, of gods in Eberron. There's clerical magic, there's divine magic, but there's no evidence of gods necessarily. There's enough that people are, are faithful, but it's not like traditional D&D &D where there's concrete proof. Yeah. Uh, and even in then there there are factions within D and D where like, well those aren't gods. They're right. just well, a, powerful a, beings. An example from my own experience, the way I decided to handle that in Star Wars Bound. Uh -huh. Religion isn't really talked about a lot because all these people came from all these different spheres and all kind of jumbled together and thrown together in the blender on this one planet. So you have all these people that believe in all these different concepts that are similar, but they call them by different names. So there are shrines everywhere to like, oh, the shrine of the morning lord, mm -hmm. or the morning, or the, you know, new beginnings. Like there's a shrine to that concept. Right. And people go and pay homage to their god at that shrine. Mm -hmm. But other than that, like people just, it's more of a personal thing because I, I wanted to have it that way because I really wanted the players, any of the players that wanted to play a cleric or uh, someone who would believe in a higher power to bring, like, what do you want to believe in? Like, I want right. you to create that. Re create and, and, that yeah. and, and for you to express that, not me informing you how you should behave. Right. Uh, because I think that that's just far more interesting. I can see that sort of like player-led uh, mm -hmm. uh, pantheon creation is something I fall back on a lot just because it, it really tailors what the player wants to be most relevant to that particular mm -hmm. campaign. Now I've done ones where you know it's monotheism with different factions and divisions within the faith, within the church of it, that represent uh, you know different elements and allow for different kinds of clerics. Moving on from sort of the, the founding myths and all those other sort mm -hmm. of high-minded questions and getting down to like the nitty-gritty of designing one yourself, there's two main approaches, right? Like you can mm -hmm. sort of the ways that you can look at uh, uh, creating a pantheon. You can either take the game first, sort of like build a game, build a set of gods that are supported by the existing game mechanics. Yeah, yeah. Or you can flip the script and create a set of gods and then if there are no game mechanics to back it up, you create them yourself. So uh, looking at game mechanics for gods, how do you do that where you're not just filing off Lathander and putting a new name on it for your <laughs> For your morning lord. I mean, if that's what's working for you, right? Mm -hmm. Like, uh, forget, skip the first part of the video and, and the rant and everything. Uh, you know, if what you want is the standard fantasy list, you know, maybe you're new to the game. Yeah. Maybe you've come from uh, you know a popular stream or something like that, and you're like, all right, well they've got these gods in critical role or, or high rollers or adventure zone or whatever it is that you're coming from. You're not steeped in years and decades of, of, of crusty game experience that you need that newness to kind of get any more more of that dopamine rush anymore. Yeah. And and the new stuff is, is fresh. It's not cliched. It's not old hat. It's not boring. Yeah. Then taking the existing. Dungeons and Dragons domains and alignments, that's a good place to start. And so you can go, all right, either I'm gonna take the domains that exist in fifth edition Dungeons and Dragons or whatever game I'm using and create gods based on those. So there's gonna be a god of war, a god of light, or whatever, or whatever, whatever. A mischievous god. <clears throat> a mischievous yeah. god, knowledge, et cetera, et cetera. Or maybe the alignment chart, you've got at least one for each alignment or maybe mm -hmm. others and that'll, at the very least you have a, a baseline there. That's one way to do it. 
And if you're looking for something quick, if you're looking for something easy, if you're looking for something that's a low barrier of entry for your players, you don't want to overload them with lore, or you want to leave the door open for them to interject their own lore uh, for those classes, or for those players who are playing divine classes, then maybe that's the way that you go. Mm -hmm. and, and you don't have to spend a ton of time on it. You just give it some thought, present it to the players, they're going to run with most of it, you'll fill in the gaps there, but you're just sort of done. You're assigning names and moving on. Yeah. That's one way of doing it. And if speed is good, if, you, if you're looking for something that's more traditional, that's the way to go. But if you're looking for something different, you want something unique, you want something that fit, that's tailor-made to your setting, then you're going to have to homebrew. And you're going to have to create the gods of the setting that you need based on whatever criteria you think is appropriate. And then if there are any holes in the game mechanics, you're gonna have to create your own domain and you're gonna have to create your own game rules to fill in that gap. I mean, if you need them, right? Like, well, I mean, it's that's by the other necessity. Big like if you see it as the DM, like, oh, there's a hole there, but if nobody's playing a cleric that needs that, right. then why worry about it, right? Yeah. Until it's necessary, and then you bring it up. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. An example of this would be something like, I'm, I'm looking for a game world that has a polytheism that I recognize from our own, from like the ancient Mediterranean. Mm -hmm. And and I'm, I'm thinking here something that's more along like, not necessarily like the Greek city-states with their patron gods, but more like the Fertile Crescent and, and that era where it's like there's Ur and, and, and yeah, and they've got like each city has its own deity and part yeah. of warfare is like stealing that god from the city because it's going to steal the, uh, you know, the power of that city. Let's make that fantastic. Yeah. And now I might have each nation or people or, or, or polity that's in the world might have a god that backs them up. But that, those gods might not map onto the existing divine domains. And so I might mm -hmm. chop up the domain and make and rearrange the abilities within them so that they fit the you know the, the new pantheon that I'm creating. I might homebrew some content and say yeah, yeah. like you know this is the city state and there's a goddess here that uh, rules over it. Knowledge isn't quite working for me here. War isn't quite working for me here. But I'm going to come up with something that that'll work for me. Yeah, yeah. This is something about being a dungeon master that when it, it, I find personally is the most frustrating for me as a internet. Dungeons and Dragons personality because I look at homebrewing content as you go fucking nuts right there is there you're no barriers here there's no wrong answers there's no whatever there are things that won't work for your table yeah but unless it's a catastrophic game session <laughs> chances are unbalanced homebrew is not going to ruin one session of your game and if it is then you need to take a step back and talk mm -hmm. to your players about what's going on, why this game element is ruining it. But creating your own homebrew content is just, you just do it. You don't need my approval, you don't need the approval of the D&D designers, you just do it. Well, I mean, if you're talking about like concepts for like deities that might just totally destroy a setting, remember that people, uh, even in the real world when it comes to religions, have accepted some crazy shit. <laughs> I mean, to go back to the Mediterranean there, I mean, the big thing about Inky and Inyana and all that is Inky goes down to the, the, the Tigris and Euphrates and, and, and skeets one out, and that's how you have those rivers. Right. Is that's literally from the, the, the girding of his loins right. and the fruit of his loins. <laughs> there's a lot of, there's so <laughs> you know, much like but, that. There's like but, bodily fluids. But that's becoming, what I'm saying is like, yeah. you gotta go pretty far to people go, Whoa, whoa, whoa. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. and it's sort of like taking the ancient Mediterranean and the ancient uh, ancient Mesopotamia as, as sort of our, our archetypes for this. Because I, I do, I think that those analogs in our own real world are better suited for the type of gaming that Dungeons and Dragons is as opposed to medieval history. I don't know that medieval history is a good historical example to you. And ancient history is a fucking huge period of time, right? But taking those models and mapping them on, that means that your pantheons are local and particular mm -hmm. and idiosyncratic. Mm -hmm. And it's not like, yeah, the Lathander that they worship over in the Northeast is the same as the Lathander they worship in the Southwest. Yeah, it's like franchising. Also. Right, like a franchise. <laughs> like a McDonald's. That's, that's what I mean when I say that they're a collection of like micro monotheisms. And uh -huh. that in baseline D&D, you've just got these, it's it's like, okay, I am a, I follow this one God. It's the same everywhere I go. There's no division. There's no conflict. There's no particularity to it. It's just 
is, it's easy is what it is. It's, yeah. it's a low barrier to entry. I, I find it so uninspiring. And I would much rather have a, a collection of just like, well, this is this city's god, and then this god is the god of the river, and maybe there's a really powerful god that, that has control over something uh, you know, that, that's very influential, but there's a, a mix and match, and they're all related to one another or interact mm -hmm. with each other in some way. A good example that I use for this sometimes, it, it, there's a role-playing game that came out gosh, 10 or 12 years ago now, uh, Artesia Adventures in the Known World, <clears throat> right? That's what I'm talking about. Oh, and yeah. it's based on a comic book series, Artesia, uh, is canceled, I, I have no idea what's happening to it. Anyway, it's one of my favorite comic book series and one of my favorite games, even though I've never really had a chance to run it. The whole world is created by this founding mythology and there's a goddess and her daughters are, you know, she begets daughters and they beget offspring and their offspring begets more and eventually mortals into the picture and some of the offspring are monsters and the interaction between the offspring and, and the, the mortals creates the ages of this world and you can see as you're reading sort of the history of this world up to the present day, the interaction of the gods both in, in intensity and like early on they're really intense and the gods are everywhere and mortals are interacting with them and then over time mortals becoming the driving factor in history and the gods receding but the impact of those gods actions are there. I like using it and I like using it as an example because it's very tightly focused. All of the gods are bound in with each other. There's not that many of them mm -hmm. and everything that exists in the setting has its origin at some point with a god. Either an offspring of one of the gods or goddesses that's there or it was created as an interaction between like, okay, well this demigod stole the sun at one point and took the sun into the underworld. So it's just like a very well thought out example of how to uh, present a fantasy pantheon that has uh, the hallmarks of real world religion, but is is definitely fantastical. And, and it's one of those things um, where if you get your hands on a copy of this book or, or some of the, the trade paperbacks that are out there uh, for the comic book series, like understanding a bit about this uh, fantasy pantheon. For me, it was like setting my brain on fire with like, I was like, oh my God, here are all the things you can do. The thing that gets me about a lot of fantasy pantheons is that it, because they're imported from our own history, they carry artifacts with them that I'm not sure, it's like, would these gods have grown up naturally in this fantasy environment here. Yeah. Like it seems like that there are other types of gods that would come about as opposed to ones that came about in our own real world, right? Like the big one that I'm thinking of, the big example of this for me is R'hllor, the Lord of Light from Song of Ice and Fire, right? Mm -hmm. This is a god that is harsh. What it wants is a little murky. Right, Pretty just nebulous. kind of like, what are we doing? Other than obedience, yeah. it, it seems, yes. is what it wants. Obey. Obey, and deny your other gods, right? Deny mm -hmm. the seven, deny your others, uh, etc. But the message, that, that, that phrase, the night is dark and full of terrors, to me, describes every Dungeons & Dragons world that exists. The night is dark. And there's a monster manual full of terrifying creatures, many of which have dark vision and are active at night. Like, why is there not a god or a deity of some kind, particularly if you have gods that are overarching, that are present from region to region, that have a consistent and, and non-localized presence, why wouldn't you have a god that's basically like, yeah, I fight monsters. I'm here to fight monsters. Mm -hmm. I will keep you safe from monsters. I am here to, you know, to fight all of the things that go bump in the night. Yeah, and, and burn it away <clears> with my purifying and light. And burn it away with my purifying light, or our allies in shadow that we use, you know, to, mm -hmm. to fight the enemies uh, of darkness, you know, that kind of thing. Because as we know, there would be no shadow without light. Uh, there wouldn't be, so, right? And that's what makes it interesting. That's right. what makes, as a faith, makes it interesting and go from one dimensional and, and adds depth and complexity to it. The Dungeons and Dragons world seems to me like, like, w there's all these little gods of each race, right? There's the orc gods and the knoll gods and the goblin gods and the whatever. What if you took all those monster manual, all the monsters in the monster manual, you ignore the lore that's that's already in there, and you rewrite that monster manual to be like, these are the offspring of deities, right? Like, all of these monsters in here come from somewhere. 
someone birthed them or created them or brought them to life. You could create a pantheon in which you create an intricate web that incorporates the monster manual and your gods. And now it's like you don't just go say fight a griffin. A griffin is the offspring of this particular deity that controls this particular thing. And, and harming a griffin will, uh, analog I would use is, is historical Tiamat. Yeah. A creature or a goddess that that sort of is is angry at the mortals who slay her her, her you know, children, her children. Mm -hmm. and, and uh, Abzu, her husband, I, I believe is like slain by Gilgamesh maybe. It's been a while since I've read the Epic of Gilgamesh. But there's just this kind of like, the sense that Tiamat is was fine until a bunch of mortals started messing with her. Yeah, getting in her yard. Getting in her yard, making a bunch of noise, mm -hmm. coming up in her business. Just wants to <laughs> sit over there and nap. <laughs> right, and then it awakens the chaos dragon. Right. That is Tiamat. So uh, that's another kind of thing. And so when you're looking at your campaign world, you know, you've made this thing, you've, you've got this all laid out, you've got your countries and your whatever, and, and when it comes to looking at the gods of your setting, are the gods that are suggested in the player's handbook working for my setting? Mm-hmm. If they do, great. If they don't, making ones up that are integrated and fit within your campaign setting is a very satisfying experience. And then you can present that information to players and it makes them feel like the campaign world is much more mm -hmm. uh, alive and, and, and realized. You yeah. Know? And I mean, and you know, everybody typically has like gods, but like, right. aren't there other ways to kind of express that divine power? Like, I mean, there are like hero gods, like in Warhammer, mm -hmm. where you mm -hmm. have mortals that kind of rise up to godhood, right. or just different kinds of like divine power that manifests that maybe is not a straight up god, god yeah. with a with a place waiting for you when you die. You right, know? right, with a home in the outer planes yeah. and celestials as interveners. Yeah, yeah. I, I like a heroes and hero cults mm -hmm. are one, and these would be sort of like, in D&D &D terms, these would be like epic level characters who've transcended mortal limits but are not yet gods, but maybe a really high level warrior in your campaign world that died a long time ago has a, a cult following of people that are devoted to them that 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 take uh, the practices that this that this warrior wrote down or or their exploits and like form a cult based around it and it's not quite religious but it's mm -hmm. definitely not just like a fan club uh, maybe there are uh, mystery religions in in which uh, the adherents have to undergo certain uh, you know secret initiation rites and understand secret knowledge about the world in order to be inducted into these uh, into these mysteries. There are demigods and gods of cities, you know, a god of a river or a mountain or a forest, little godlings that are, are powerful spirits uh, that, that inhabit a location or a place mm -hmm. or something like that. Those are all ways of interjecting um, a vibrant world of the divine mm -hmm. into your campaign without having to resort to you know, Zeus, knock off Zeus up in knock off Mount Olympus, you know, not doing anything interesting. The divine community of your game mm -hmm. as something more than just that bog standard fantasy pantheon means that, first off, you're tailoring it to the campaign world, deepening your own campaign setting. And when the players finally interact with something like that, you have something that's fleshed out, that's different than new. You might be showing them something new that they haven't seen before, letting them interact with something different. And you'll create moments in your campaign where before your players might live like, I'm not really cared about what's going on with this church or temple or whatever. By having something different and making it weird and unusual and, and fitting with your game and not just taking the standard that's there, you create an opportunity to make a, a really memorable element of your setting come to life and, and presenting it to your players and saying like, here's something different I'm, I'm, I'm offering up. As, as a way to you know do something different with your character or help me create something new for the world that we're playing in. Right in the book of Revelations here for your gods. How does it all end? What do you, I mean, what, what's the, what's the so, end? I mean, you got a founding myth, you should have a, 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 a apocalypse myth, certainly. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> like a founding myth, having these other things about how the world is gonna end, how the gods would participate in that. What are the role of mortals in that end of the world? Is it a conflagration that ends in oblivion or is it simply a change of cycle? A period of turmoil before the new thing happens? Yeah. Is it prophesied? Is it something that the players can stop or, or influence in some way? I think it's just as enriching to to, talk, to think about like the end of your world, of your campaign's world, and the role that the gods play in it as it is the beginning of the world and, and how the gods do it. God creates dinosaurs.
dinosaurs. God destroys dinosaurs. God creates man. Man destroys God. Man creates dinosaurs. Women inherit the earth. 